Back up. Sorry, guys. Had to save that file. Tweet your friends. KPFA stream. At KPFA stream. For the KPFA video channel. We're here for her. We're here for Katie Moore. We're here for Ayana. We're here for black women. We're here for black men. We're here for black trans folks. We're here for black. I did. Well, I saw that. What happened? Oh. My legs. You know. My stream. What happened to my stream? I don't know. I think we had two of them going at once. That's all good. I'm out here with Frank Sterling and myself. Rayman Sullivan. Out here by Berkeley City Hall. I'm gonna hang by the front of the uh, city hall here. Alright. I'm gonna march forward. Yeah, keep on going. Alright, KPFA viewers, KPFA stream. Share it with your friends. I'm gonna move back to the front of the march. Everyone, KPFA live stream. When do we want it? Now! When do we want justice? When do we want it? Now! When do we want justice? When do we want it? Now! When do we want justice? When do we want it? Now! When do we want justice? When do we want it? Now! When do we want justice? When do we want it? Now! When do we want justice? When do we want it? Now! When do we want justice? KPFA stream channel at KPFA stream. Yes. Share with your friends. Yes, y'all give it up for yourself. Just entering uh, MLK Junior Way. KPFA stream channel. Yeah, 
Bam. Tape. Sorry. Sorry, guys. I want to be right up front when you guys... Back up now. police comports itself. Increasingly, Berkeley Police Department has become a militarized department. It hides. It refuses to disclose any basic information about its functioning. Now we have a special response team. It's a SWAT team. That's not how Berkeley used to work. Now we've got, we've got officers participating in urban shield activities, getting military training, and bringing it here to the streets of Berkeley. And it can only lead us to wonder, is that, does that training and the culture of the Berkeley Police Department as a militarized force, does that have something to do with why they chose to prioritize observing protests over saving the life of a man who was having a heart attack only blocks away from the protest? The delayed response time by Berkeley Police Department resulted in a death. And we have to ask this council, is the leadership of Berkeley Police Department, do they really have our best interests at heart? Is community safety really what they're here for? I say no. 
And, I, and I'm going to ask you guys to go ahead and cop watch. I'm going to ask you every time you see police on these streets, videotape, collect the data, and hold their feet to the fire. Stay strong tonight because I also want to say that an independent investigation by the current police review commission is not the answer to our prayers. These guys are dragging their feet. The police department won't release documents. And in our current form, our police review commission is ineffective. So we've got to overhaul the whole system of civilian oversight. So stay strong, stay with it, and power to the people. Thank you. city regarding police behavior and activity. It's because of you and your steadfastness and your repeated presence here that we have on the agenda tonight three very important items uh, sponsored by uh, Jesse Aragin and other council members uh, to ensure that we follow up on those principles that we know underlie good policing and good First Amendment rights protection. So we'll be in there fighting for that, and you be out here fighting, and you fight every way you can, because this is what changes things. Your presence has changed things, and it will continue to change things. And those of us who stand with you will continue to stand with you and ensure that we follow through and get some of these things done. We need police that are charged by crimes with special prosecutors in charge, not the good old boy network with the DA. We need that. We need the Police Review Commission to be restored to its full legitimacy and power so that they can protect us. We also need an end to tear gassing, overhead strikes, and other brutal tactics that are used on peaceful demonstrators. So you have allies, and you are the troops, and together we're going to change things. Ain't no power like the power of the people, because the power of the people don't stop. Say what? Ain't no power like the power of the people, because the power of the people don't stop. Ain't no power like the power of the people, because the power of the people don't stop. Ain't no power like the power of the people, because the power of the people don't stop. If anyone needs to get in the building or out of the building, this is the path. Tom's helping me. Tom, get down there. I'm flashing a walkway. So if the photographers and news folks can kind of keep a little bit of a path here, otherwise folks will be stuck. We don't want that. Yeah, I got you. All right, so people, next up on our lineup, we have a civil rights lawyer who will tell us how we can win. I'd like to introduce John Burris to the stage. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 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 Thank you, thank you,
terrific to be here amongst all of you, having been practicing law and, uh, for a number of years and, and essentially doing police misconduct work where I've sued well over 500 police officers during my time. And, and many African Americans, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives have been the focal point of racial profiling, illegal arrests, beatings, and of course, uh, shooting deaths that have been unconscionable and, and certainly unjustified. So whenever we can have gatherings and people can consider those issues, it's extraordinarily important. Having been involved in the Riders case for over 10 years in Oakland, I know that you can do it. The only thing that I regret about the Riders case in terms of our ability to do the reform, that we did not include you and the community people in it early enough. Because if we had, some of the reforms that we put together could have been better, it could have been enforced a lot sooner, and it might have had less resistance on the part of the police. So you are at a time now where you can participate. It is a very important that there are, if you have cop watch here, you have city council. One thing I would say to you is that give some thought to what you really want to occur and keep happening. Because I think it's important, obviously, you want to ensure that, that there are video cameras present. Not only is that present, that they are being used. I've been involved in at least 10 cases, since shooting cases since Ferguson. Five or six of those cases were supposed to have had cameras on. None of them did. So what use is there if you have a camera and you don't turn it on? So part of what you have to insist upon, one, that there are cameras, and number two, that they have to be turned on, and if they're not turned on, there's a price to pay. So that is very, very important uh, in doing so. The, the accountability question, you have to hold officers accountable. They have to be a price to pay when you wrongfully hurt someone, wrongfully kill someone, wrongfully arrest them, engage in racial profiling. We as a community have to hold them up to it. And, and so I, so, so it's important that the public officials hear what you have to say. It's also important that you get people together in smaller groups who can sit down and thrash out some of the reforms you want to have and make a demand for those particular reforms. Because if you don't do it, as, they, as Frederick Douglass has said once upon a time, power conceives nothing without a demand, never has and never will. And all of you are in a position to collectively make those demands. And so I'm here to support you. I, I'm in a unique position that I can do these things as a lawyer. I look at Kyla Moore, you can see I, I'm representing her, her family and representing many other families that have been wrongfully killed. And, and, and so I can be helpful in that sense. But the real power comes from you, your ability to put pressure on public officials and pressure on various committees that exist and make yourself heard. So I stand in, um, in solidarity with you. Black Lives Matter, and they matter more than one can imagine. Thank you. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. All right, so we're gonna have another democratically elected. City Council member Jesse Aragani, main sponsor of these bills tonight, come speak to you about why it's important that we stand with Ferguson Action and we form our community. This is what democracy looks like. When the people of Berkeley come out and take the streets and demand that our elected representatives take action. It's been two months since the police shot tear gas, rubber bullets, and clubbed nonviolent protesters who simply were standing up to say that black lives matter. And we're here today to say it's time to take action. It's time to say that nonviolent protests in Berkeley is allowed. It's time to say that black lives matter. It's time for the city to stand up and support the demands from Ferguson, that we end the militarization of police, that we end racial profiling, and that we improve police community relations, and that we address the deep inequities that exist, not just in Ferguson, but right here in Berkeley. We cannot ignore the fact that despite however progressive of a city we are, racial profiling still exists to this day. We have deep inequities in our schools on the basis of race. We have inequities in terms of health. We have inequities in terms of wealth. 
This movement is one of the most inspiring movements that I've seen in my lifetime. Yeah. Where the black community stood up and said, enough is enough. We're going to demand change. And when and progressive people and people throughout the country stand in solidarity with them to demand that we finally have real reform, real change to address racial inequity in our society. But the only way we're going to do it is if we turn out and we demand that our elected leaders take action. Yeah. So I am really proud to be here today to stand in solidarity with all of you to demand that enough is enough. It's time for the city council to take action tonight. We need to pass the measure to have body cameras and make sure those cameras are turned on all the time. We need to demand that the police stop the use of tear gas and rubber bullets and respect the right for peaceful assembly in the streets of Berkeley. And we need to stand in solidarity with the people in Ferguson and the people throughout our country that want real change to address the inequities that exist in our society. So, I urge all of you to join us at the city council meeting after this rally and demand that the council take action tonight. Unfortunately, unless we speak out, it's not going to happen. But this is what democracy is about. People coming out, speaking out, and demanding change and demanding reform. That's how we're going to change things in Berkeley, and that's how we're going to change things in our country. So I'm proud to stand here in solidarity with you and to demand action and to say that Black Lives Matter in Berkeley throughout our country and every single day. Thank you. No justice, no peace, no racist police. 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 All right, people. So next up on the stage we have Formal city council member Ying Lee. Yeah. Thank you. I agree with Jesse. Our constant presence in the street will be what brings any changes that we need to to bear fruit. It's a, it's been incredibly impressive since Ferguson that the activity has gone on on almost a daily basis. We are not forgetting. We are definitely moving on. You know, it embarrasses me to say that, of course, black lives matter. This is something that we should take for granted. And when I see the troops, I mean, are we a military, are we under military government? To, to, to see those tanks and those guns and our own police, they are our civil servants. We are not a subject people who need to be brutalized by the police, whether at a national level or at a local level. And I think our presence on a daily basis, just constant agitation, is the only way we're going to get any changes. I'm so happy to be a part of you. Do you know that the Police Review Commission that we talk about was created over 40 years ago? Not by the council, but by the initiative process. Because the people who were demonstrating against the Vietnam War were constantly not only did they have to fight against national policy, we had to fight our local police. The police in some ways has improved since then, has improved for just about everyone, except to our shame against African Americans. And this has got to change, because all the idealism that we have about this country just dissipates where African Americans are concerned. Each one of us who is not African American should be ashamed and be part of that battle. And I'm happy to join you. Um, let's take a moment to join in song. We're going to have Nancy Armstrong Temple lead us in song. Don't get in front of the speaker. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. This is Ella's song. If you don't know it, the chorus goes like this. You can sing it with us. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Sing it again. We who believe in freedom We who believe in freedom cannot rest 
rest until it comes. Until the killing of black men, black mother's son is as important as the killing of white men, white mother's son. Say, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who Militarization looks like in our community because it's not just about tear gas or AK 47s or guns that the police should not have from the war on drugs that should have never happened. It's about it's about militarization as a mindset. It's about it's about cops believing that they're here and that we're here and that we're not all part of the same community because if they thought they were part of the community, we wouldn't have the unrightful, unjust deaths that we do. And so, and so it's not just about body cameras, because as we all saw Eric Garner take his last words on video, and we saw the illegal actions of that one cop, who I can't even speak his name, it's too much for me actually, and we didn't get an indictment there. So it's, we don't just want body cameras. That might as well be jewelry. I don't want to pay for that. What I want to see, what I want to see is cops become less untouchable because it's not about a society where we have cops here and us here. That's not what we're here for. We want a democracy. We want all lives to matter, but we specifically want black lives too because they don't now. We are, thank you, thank you. We are underrepresented. Our voices are rarely heard, and that's why we're here today. Because honestly, if you can indict a ham sandwich, this is like my least favorite quote, honestly. They say that you can indict a ham sandwich, and somehow you can't indict a cop committing a legal act on video. So I don't want body cameras, and I'm not gonna suggest that we buy a lot of them. What I want is systematic reform for the institutional racism that I see every single day. And in a lot of ways, we look at Berkeley and we go, well, it's Berkeley, we're not racist. It's Berkeley, it's not the South, we're better. And we think that we are above those who have other types of injustice, but we have injustice here. We have a whole different form of racism that you don't have to see every day. It's not as blatant. It's not all in your face, but it's a, you're a good black. It's a, oh, Khadijah, you're not like those other girls. You're, you're articulate. And there's a problem with that. That's, that's a whole nother type of racism that we have created here because we're liberal and we're progressive. So let me see your liberalness and let me see your progressiveness as we push for a more just future. Come on. Because I want to see a world where black lives really matter, where black people are taking real offices, where black people get to have the same say that white people have here. Come on. And so, yeah. And so just, just to remind you of my talking points, because everything that I said was important, but just in case you forgot, we need to demilitarize. Not just as far as weapons, but as 
a mindset. We need to demilitarize. We need to think about people and humans as humans. Number two, I want to see less body camera action and more cultural competen competency training. I need to see cops and officers who see me as a person and not as a black thing. All right? And I appreciate you guys, and I appreciate the Cal BSU and the BCC BSU, and I just want to make shout outs to them. Um, we appreciate you. UC Berkeley showed us how. They're showing us how, and we really appreciate them. Black power, stay strong, y'all. with you all. I'm handing out flyers and I'm talking with people like, come to this rally, come to this march in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. And more times than not, I get like, why? Like, what are you guys, what are you guys marching about now? What, what's wrong now? Like, and I have to explain to them like, this isn't in response to an isolated event. It's not just about Mike Brown. Like, our lives depend on these efforts. Like, you don't get it. And I keep telling them, like, if we don't organize, if we don't act, we will continue to be murdered, we will continue to be beat, we will continue to be gassed if it weren't for these efforts right here. And another thing, we just have to remember that we're in this together. This isn't just about Black Lives Matter. This is about democracy. This is about equality. And this is about humanity. We all are human and we all are in this together. Black Lives Matter. We all matter. But Black Lives Matter, y'all. Yeah. Legalize Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Legalize Blackness. That one was fire. Okay. Second round of applause, people. Second round of applause. All right. Moni, want to make an announcement real quick? Moni, I'm doing this one too. Um, so we have LaShonda at the foot of the stairs keeping a path open. And if we can make sure people can come in and out of the building, because our agenda items will be up first. And we want people there to testify. If you're a student that was uh, clubbed, gassed, or a grenade thrown at you, can you raise your hand? You might want to come inside and testify to that. Um, is it full outside? Inside? Do we know? If it's getting full inside, Spencer's in charge of lining up speakers. Spencer. So, folks, it's starting to happen soon. And if you want to be inside to testify, you might want to make your way inside. But the rally will continue. Thank you, Senator Gordon, for coming. Everybody else, y'all here, come on. Everybody up that's going to testify. And thank you, David and Iman. Continue. All right. So, real quick, we're going to sing the Freedom Challenge song. I can't really sing, but y'all help me out, okay? We'll pray for you. Help me out. I can hear my neighbor calling, I can't breathe, now I'm in a struggle, singing, I can't breathe, calling out the violence of these racist police, we ain't gonna stop till people are free, we ain't gonna stop till people are free. Racist police, we ain't gonna stop 
Till our people are free. We ain't gonna stop till our people are free. Save me because y'all know I can't say. All right, so next on the mic, we have someone who helped to reclaim a particular weekend. If you are tired of seeing our leaders get co-opted, raise your hand because I know I am. People try to make King like King see me like he was docile, like he wasn't going to change anything, like he actually liked America, like America actually liked him. So. What, who we're going to bring up right now is someone representing the Anti-Police Terror Project, the, the people who organized 92 hours of direct action in the Bay Area. Please give it up for Frank Sosa. Thank you very much. He just said everything I was about to open with. Yes, the ATPT, APTP put out the call for 96 hours of direct action. It concluded with a march of 7,000 people marching from, from, uh, from the Fruitvale BART station where Oscar Grant was gunned down all the way to Coliseum City, which is pretty much the new site of gentrification that's happening over there on the east side. Um, Anti-Police Terror Project is trying to build a sustainable model for how we can combat police violence in our community. So if you guys want to get down with ATPTP, they're meeting every uh, third Wednesday of every month at the Eastside Arts Alliance in yeah. East Oakland. So let me give you a rundown of what's going on over there in our community. I live right by West Oakland. And uh, a few weeks ago, this cat saw some people hanging outside of his garden. And uh, he went out there with the gun, started bucking down on these people. Started bucking down. Apparently the two people he started bucking down on were cops. Guess what they did? They identified their, themselves as cops and got him to put down his gun. And they arrested him peacefully. I guess he had the complexion for the protection. So fast forward to last week, apparently there's some sort of altercation at Home Depot where a woman was apparently caught shoplifting. We don't know all the details what happened. Some say there was a gun. We do know that she was injured in this altercation. They had an amb amb ambulance on their way. The police never positively identified this person, but right down the street where this person with the protection for the complexion got gunned down, cops rolled up on her and shot her dead. Since then, there's been a, camp a campaign in the media to dehumanize this person. Dehumanize her, a, tr a trial by media. We don't know all the facts, but we do know that there were cameras. If she was gunned down right here, there's a camera right there, there's a camera right there, and there's a camera right there. Emeryville Police Department wants to talk about all kinds of stuff around this case, but they kind of don't want to talk about those cameras. So this morning, what we did is we brought a list of demands to the OPD, who's, the, who's heading up the investigation, to the Emery, Emeryville Police Department, and to all the stores that were involved uh, to release their footage that they have. Basically, what we need to do is demand that they release this footage because it is, it, it's not cool that they have a trial by media. This is part of the dehumanizing of black lives and it's enough. Color of Change got behind this this morning. They put out a call, they, they put out the numbers of people to call to support this, this campaign, but that's all I've got to say for now. Um, if you guys want to get down with APTP, like I said, third Wednesday every month. Peace. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, her name was Yvette Henderson. Yvette Henderson. She has a name. When I say all power, you say to the people, all power! To the people! All power! To the people! All power! To the people! Stand with your chest, y'all. All power! To the people! All power! To the people! All right, y'all. So next, we are going to bring up someone who will stir your soul. I'm telling you, y'all, there is something very interesting about the way spirituality plays in social movements. Next, I want I would like to introduce Pastor Michael McBride. On 
August 9th, Michael Brown was killed in his own community by the Ferguson Police Department. And since August 9th, the community of Ferguson has been terrorized by a militarized police force. We have all been awakened to the dangers of unchecked police power in our communities. I went to Ferguson and while I was there, I experienced firsthand the brutality of the Ferguson Police Department. I was arrested, I was tear gassed, was hit with batons, pushed in the back with assault rifles, called the N-word, all kinds of dehumanizing behavior. When I came back to the Bay Area, and someone asked me, how does Ferguson and the Bay Area compare? At first, I said it was apples and oranges. Right outside my congregation on the evening of December 6th, we all watched with horror at a police response that made us think if you did not know where you were, that you were in Ferguson. And part of what I believe is important for all of us to appreciate in this moment, Dr. King said it best that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. everywhere. And you and I have a responsibility in this city and in this region to make sure that our elected officials who are progressive about everything except for the protection of black lives, feels the power and the accountability of all people. It is not enough to say that you champion black people, brown people, and poor people with your words, but you refuse to back it up with your policy decisions. It is not enough to come and seek out our vote during an election season, but in between election cycles, you are nowhere to be found to champion the plight of black people, brown people, and poor people who make up your constituency. It is not enough for our white brothers and sisters and other allies to only show up at the macro aggressions of structural racism when they make themselves visible and be silent and absent at the daily micro aggressions of racism that are grinding our communities into the dust. So part of what our work has to be is more than the sensationalization of movement. It must mean that every day you wake up and your feet are blessed to hit the floor, you must answer the question, which side are you on? On the freedom side. Are you on the side of freedom or are you on the side of the status quo? Now, I want to certainly say, as I stand here as a pastor in this city, that for too long, our clergy have often been sitting on the sidelines or on the wrong side. But I stand here representing dozens of clergy, pastors and congregations here in this city, Covenant Worship Center, Berkeley Mount Zion, McGee Avenue Baptist Church, Church Without Walls, uh, St. Paul AME Church. The list goes on and on and on. Good Shepherd, on and on and on. Clergy and congregations are standing in solidarity of black lives because we know if black lives really matter, then everyone's life will matter. So I want us to really be very clear that we are in an age of revolution. And for whatever reason, God has chosen us to be alive during this time. I hope we will not have to embellish our record when our children and grandchildren ask us, what did we do in the age of the revolution to make Black Lives Matter? I hope we will not have to lie. I hope we will not have to say what we did and embellish it, but we can look with honesty and integrity and say it, I was on the right side of history. This is our fight. This is our moment. May we show through our actions that black lives do indeed matter. God bless you. Thank you.
do a sweeter job my face. Way to sleep. Okay. I'm looking for the water of justice. Will you wait in the water with me? Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. We're troubling the water right now. Thank you to the pastor for showing up. Also, um, our other interfaith members, the Buddhist monks and the rabbis who showed up, thank you for showing your support and being in solidarity with this movement. And also, give it up for y'all. Everybody who showed up in November, in December, in January for protests, for marches, got beaten, got tear gassed, got arrested. Over 700 people arrested in one night. And you know what? Of all those people, only 14 I know of were charged. The 14 people who stopped the BART on Black Friday. Black Friday 14, so we got a member. We got a mem, drop the charges, oh yeah. Oh yeah. We got uh, Devonte Jackson, one of the Black Fr Friday 14, here to talk about it. Thank you, thank you. So I'll start by reading a quote from Dr. King. It's a long one, so bear with me. Um, There's nothing wrong with the traffic law which says you have to stop for a red light. But when the fire is raging, the fire truck goes right through that red light and normal traffic had better get out of its way. Or when a man is bleeding to death, the ambulance goes through those red lights at top speed. Disinherited people all over the world are bleeding to death from deep social and economic wounds. They need brigades of ambulance drivers who will have to ignore the red lights of the present system until the emergency is solved. Massive civil disobedience is a strategy for social change which, which is at least as for, forceful as an ambulance with its sirens on full. So, I just wanted to start that off because what I like to say is that the Black Friday 14 acted as a black ambulance. We were the black firefighters. And, and what, what we were saying is that we're taking action right now to end the war on black people. And what we were saying, the war on black people looked like we expanded the scope from the criminal justice system. We shut down West Oakland BART station to address gentrification. I'm three generations of Oakland. My great grandmother had a house um, in West Oakland on Filbert. A white family now owns that house, right? And so this is what we're talking about when we're taking action against the state sanctioned war on black people. Today we're talking about police militarization. We're talking about police accountability. We're talking about an aggressive response by Berkeley police to protesters who are responding, who are taking justice action for black lives. So today we gotta ask what does police accountability look like? We gotta talk about what does justice for black people look like? And, and for me, that justice looks like a reduction of the police power and presence in our communities. Like, like Sister said from Berkeley High School, it's not about getting more police cameras. We've seen Eric Garner killed on tape, right? And then he wasn't indicted. Similarly, in Berkeley, Kayla Moore was suffocated to death, a uh, transgender black woman with schizophrenia and Berkeley police were not held accountable for that murder. The district attorney of Alameda County, Nancy O'Malley, has a history of not prosecuting murderers of black people. 
This is true not only for Caleb Moore, but Alan Bluford, Raheem Brown, Derek Jones. So what, what does it take to really change the circumstance? Because I'm mad. I'm here because I'm angry, because black people have no value in this country, right? We live in a country that allows people to murder us with, no, with impunity. So today I'm saying that we have to take radical action. This is not just about reform, right? This is about transformation of systems that continually oppress us. This is a historical matter. This is a historical matter too. This is not an isolated in incident. What we're saying is that the racism that black people are facing today is part of a long legacy, beginning with the enslavement of black people in the forced labor. Right? The country is built on racism rooted in anti-blackness. So it takes all hands on deck. It takes us right now to demand that the Berkeley City Council uh, appear, like take to the demands of the people right now. This is a growing movement. It takes all hands on deck to really change the reality. The Black Friday 14 needs all of your support. The BART board is demanding $70,000 in restitution for our peaceful, <laughs> right, right, it's a shame. Demanding $70,000 for a justice action. Right, and they're uh, demanding uh, charges to be pressed too. So what it takes is for the community to really up the pressure on Nancy O'Malley, hold her accountable, not only to uh, bringing justice to the Black Friday 14, but to all the victims of police murders in our community in Alameda County. Thank you all for being out here today. Continue the pressure and Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Thank you, Devontae. All right, people. One of the things that cannot, that just personify the contradictions within the United States is that we live in a police state, yet we live in a democracy, right? It doesn't make sense. A police state is supposed to keep people repressed. It's supposed to get, like make sure the people are voiceless. It's supposed to make sure that people have no hope. And this police state operates in specific ways that make people who look like me have no voice at all. This is what we are up against, people. We are trying to transform the police state in the United States. That is what we are doing here today. We are taking a step in the direction toward freedom. Now, one thing I want to say is that they have always tried to strip people, strip community members of their voice. And now we are going to open up the space for public comment so that way you can express your voice. Your voice matters. Your life matters. We believe that your life matters. So first, I would like to introduce Berkeley community member, Patrice Barabas. Thank you. I'm 86 years old. I stood here with an open heart surgery. I stood here because I have seen the, the, the hate of what some of these police have done to my people for all of my 86 years. We have been a target. Three little pickings sitting in the shell. One got kicked out and one got killed. See, they, what they did to you, they're making money off you. My youth, they're making money off you. Right there at Berkeley High School. My son's picture, and it was totally integrated. You see this, this shirt I got on? This is from the Berkeley Fire Department. I sold this shirt in London. I sold it in Frankfurt, Germany. I sold it in Houston, Texas. We work together. But today I see the police department, when they came down on our 19th of June, they got a motorcycle, the four of them, and they started coming down the streets. The very first time I had ever seen these cops. And I said, where are you going? We got children playing. You don't do this in Albany. No, they didn't do it in Albany. But now they stop, you, stop me, an 86-year-old woman, going to an emergency with my child, 
and say probable cause. Uh, yes, I got a, a, a 1905 uh, 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 Chrysler 300. I worked all my life to get something. But never in my life have I had a wreck, two, two or three wrecks a year. And then when I, I ride down the streets, I ride down the streets where I know that they're taking pictures because it's not safe. I tried to come to the council and talk to them. My ID was stolen. Do you think one of them come to me? Do you think I sit right here at the police station? Not a part cop came down to see what I was going to have. They told me they was going to take my house by any means necessary. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? An 86-year-old woman. So this is discrimination. Children, I'm backing you. But one of the things I'm going to ask of you, do it peacefully, okay? Do it peacefully. We don't have to destroy what we have to go back and go, we don't have the transportation, as many of us, to go to the other stores. And the very first food that you see at the dollar store, that all came from the army. So I'm gonna tell it like it is. You see, because once they leave a place, they leave the food. So they buy enough food, so, so this is a military state. A black man is not allowed in the Emancipation Proclamation to own a, a federal gun license to buy a gun. So who's selling us the gun? Sorry, KPFA followers. Okay. Um, this is people in Franklin here. I gotta sign off and get back to you, KPFA. And you're sitting, um, keep watch on Twitter at KPFA Stream for future sleep. events. And be so sure to tune in March 4th, 5th, and 6th. And listen to Flashpoints on KPFA for machines. information and demonstrations from country. Creech Air Force Base, Nevada. Signing off, uh, KPFA Stream Channel. Good night. What is it? I want you to put it